All right, good morning, everyone. So it is 10.05 and we are going to get started. Um, my name is Peyton Pierce and I'm your RFSI grant coordinator. Um, and in this, we also have Jason Jones, the Jason Jones. He's going to be helping me with some any kind of technical problems I might have and um, any type of um, questions if our chat gets a little overwhelmed. Um, okay, um, so we, he's going to be helping me with that. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, everyone, I'm assuming, can see um, the listening session for USDA Resilient Food System Infrastructure Program. Um, so how today is going to kind of work, we're going to go over this PowerPoint and then after that, we're going to teach you how to download these applications. Um, if you've tried, there is a certain way that you have to download them and they're uh, it's a little wonky. So we are going to go over that. Um, we are also going to go over some UEI and magic stuff that you've got to have. We'll get to that. Um, later in the day, though. So let's go ahead and get started. OK, so Mississippi Department of Ag or MDAC has entered into a cooperative agreement with the United States Department of Agriculture, USDA, to administer the Resilient Food System Infrastructure Program. This program will allow USDA to make grants and agreements to maintain and improve food and agricultural supply chain resiliency. I would like to point out that this is USDA is going to be authorized to make these grants, so they get the final say so. Um, when it comes to anything with this grant, um, they we will have to turn in the um, applications that we select and they will make the final yes or no. So we are really just the pass through agency. So any of these eligibility um, things that are eligible, things that are ineligible, that's not something that Mississippi Department of Ag has created. That is USDA language. So we are just the pass through agency and we just want to stress that. We are very excited for this grant and we are very grateful for this grant, but we are just the pass through agency. All right, our program purpose so the purpose of the RFSI program is to assist states in building resilience in the middle of the supply chain and strengthening local food systems by creating new. I'm sorry, I'm lost. <laughs> in the supply chain by strengthening local food system by creating new revenue streams for producers. The goal of this program is to create additional and better processing options for local producers across the state's food supply chain. The program funding. So through this program, the Department of Ag will make available over $5.8 million worth of funding in USDA that will be subawarded to eligible entities in the form of infrastructure grants and equipment only grants to the middle of the supply chain businesses. So, and we'll get into this a little bit more, you can only apply for one of these grants. Now, the way that we can kind of work around that, if you are building some infrastructure and you would also like to put, say, um, some cold storage freezers in there. Those cold storage freezers are considered equipment, um, but the building that you've built is considered infrastructure. So the way that we go about that, if you would like to do both. You need to apply for an infrastructure grant and you need to include your equipment in there. And we, you'll see that when we go over our applications, it's got a spot in your infrastructure application where you can put in equipment. Um, but if you are strictly just purchasing equipment, then equipment only is going to be the grant that you want to apply for. But if you're building any type of infrastructure, improving on any type of infrastructure, you'll need to apply for an infrastructure grant. All right. What is the middle of the supply chain? So our food supply chain consists of production, processing, aggregation and distribution, and then markets and consumers. So for 
this program, we are strictly focused on these two in the middle. So our processing and aggregation or distribution. So anything that happens before this is not eligible. Anything that happens after this is also not eligible. So tractors, I get a lot of questions about are tractors eligible? They are not. Um, that is considered a harvest piece of equipment. And that is, this is a post harvest grant. Tractors are also general pieces of equipment. Um, likewise with say a generator, a generator, a tractor, um, a side by side, those are considered general pieces of equipment. So if your equipment that is being purchased cannot be specifically tied to processing, aggregation, or distribution, then it's going to be generalized pieces of equipment and they will not be eligible. Um, and we will go over some more eligibility questions later on in the PowerPoint. Okay. Program descriptions. So the activities that the RFSI program will focus on are going to be, and when I say activities, the way that they kind of define this, um, your entire project that you're doing, if you're building something, you're putting in equipment, that is your project. Now, the activities that you do within that project, this is what we're talking about here. So they're going to take priority to activities that expand capacity for processing, aggregation, and distribution of agricultural products to create more and better markets for producers. Modernizing manufacturing, tracking, storage, and information technology systems. Enhance worker safety through adoption of new technologies or investments in equipment or facility improvements. Improve the capacity of entities to comply with federal, state, and local food safety requirements. Improve operations through training opportunities. Support construction of new facilities. Modernize or expand an existing facility. Construction of water waste management structures, modernize processing and manufacturing equipment, develop, customize, or install equipment that reduces greenhouse gas emissions, increases efficiency and water use, improves air and or water quality, and or meets one or more of USDA's climate action goals. I also, I forgot to mention these page numbers at the bottom. Those are going to correlate to our request for application. So if any of these slides, if you need a little bit more information on anything in this, um, these correlate to our request for applications. And if you go on there, it will give you a little bit more information on each slide. All right. So the projects, remember we talked about the project is the entirety of what you're going to be doing. So the projects that RFSI is going to focus their funding on are going to be projects that offer family supporting job quality and treatment of slash safety of workers. They're gonna focus on small and medium sized enterprises that add options and choices for consumers and producers with an emphasis on value added. They're gonna demonstrate local support for the project, support underserved communities, and are going to be submitted by cooperatives, farmers, and worker owned enterprises. I will say on this, um, we have gotten some clarification on USDA that while an individual farmer can apply for this program, especially when it comes to infrastructure, they are stressing that these projects that are going to be funded are going to be more competitive if they impact multiple producers. So you know, for equipment, it's kind of hard for us when we purchase equipment to impact multiple producers, but it can be done. So especially with infrastructure, if your project is only benefiting you as a single producer, you can still apply. Um, but those that are going to benefit multiple producers are going to take priority. OK, so over the summer we had some outreach sessions and through those we got public comments from Mississippi farmers, industry and stakeholders. 
And we just kind of wanted to get a feel for what was needed in Mississippi as far as the middle of the supply chain. And here are some of the ones that we have identified. So processing equipment to increase capacity to process agricultural products, post harvest transportation of agricultural products, processing facilities, storage, cold storage warehousing and distribution facilities, traceability systems and quality control measures, and expansion of new markets. So with that, with the outreach sessions and the public comments that we got, we took that and we identified some of our funding priorities for the state of Mississippi. So for MDAC, our goal through RFSI is to create more and better processing options for local and regional producers across specialty crops, dairy, grain for food, and other eligible sectors by targeting gaps and opportunities in the pandemic assistance, food systems transportation programs, and existing USDA grant programs that support the agricultural supply chain. Our identified funding priorities are going to be projects that expand capacity for aggregation distribution of agricultural products, the construction of new facilities and expanding existing facilities for processing, aggregation, packing and labeling, transporting, storing, including cold storage and warehousing, and the distribution of agricultural products that are strategically located near production areas in order to create opportunities for value added food production. Modernizing equipment used in the middle of the food supply chain, including post harvest washing, packing, storing, aggregation, distribution. Allow for the purchase of refrigerated trucks to improve food quality and increase shelf life of pro products and modernize manufacturing, tracking, storing and information technology systems. Mississippi priority markets. So these are the markets that are going to take priority in Mississippi. It's going to be institutions like schools and healthcare facilities, retails, retailers and wholesalers, food hubs, farmers markets, including our mobile farmer markets, online marketplaces and delivery platforms, food banks and restaurants. Our eligible entities. So this now we're getting into the meat and potatoes of this grant. So the entities that are eligible to apply for your RFSI grant are going to be agricultural producers or processors or groups of those. Nonprofit local government, tribal governments and institutions that are operating in the middle of the supply chain. So any of these last four bullet points can apply, but they have got to operate in the middle of the supply chain. And all applicants, businesses and organizations must be domestically owned and applicants facilities must be physically located in the state of Mississippi. So if you live in Mississippi, but you have a facility in Louisiana, you need to apply for a Louisiana RFSI grant. Um, if you have a farm in Mississippi or a facility in Mississippi, but you live in Louisiana, then you would apply for the Mississippi RFSI grant. It is where the facility or where the farm is going to be, not where the individual lives. OK, so some examples of eligible projects now projects as a whole. This is just a few examples. Um, you know, this project, it has really an unlimited <laughs> number of examples of eligible projects. Um, so expanding processing capabilities, including adding product types, increasing production volumes and supporting new wholesale retail product lines, modernizing equipment or facilities through upgrades, repairs or retooling. Purchase and installation of specialized equipment such as processing components, sorting equipment, packing and labeling equipment, or delivery vehicles. Modernizing manufacturing, tracking storage and information technology systems. Enhancing worker safety through the adoption of new technologies or investments in equipment or facility improvements. 
construction of a new facility, increasing packaging and labeling capacities that meet compliance requirements under applicable laws, increasing storage space, including cold storage, develop, customize, or install climate smart equipment that reduces greenhouse gas emissions, increases our water efficiency, improves air or water quality, and or meets one or more of USDA's climate action goals, modernize equipment or facilities to ensure food safety, and training on all use of equipment purchased under the grant and associated new processes. All right, so our ineligible projects. Acquiring real property. We will go over this when we get into our infrastructure grants. You cannot purchase property with this grant. The property must already be in place. Projects focused on meat, poultry, wild caught seafood, exclusively animal feed and forage products, fiber, landscaping products, tobacco, or dietary supplements. So meat and poultry, they are talking about, they're not including eggs in this. So egg production is eligible under this grant, but that is going to be a very tricky line. Um, it's got to be after that egg has been laid. So any chicken coops um, are gonna be ineligible because they consider that pre-harvest. Um, so anything to do with after the egg has been laid and processing it, would be included. Um, wild caught seafood. So if you are doing farm raised catfish, farm raised crawfish, those are all eligible as long as they are farm raised. Exclusively animal feed and forage products. Um, I get a lot of questions about storage units for hay. That is ineligible because that is not for human consumption, number one. Um, this any of these they've got to be for human consumption so if you are running um say a grain business and you need a grain bin to store your grain in if you cannot pinpoint where that grain goes and you cannot 100 percent say yes this goes for human consumption then it's going to be ineligible under this grant. Now, if you know for a fact that your grain is being sold for human consumption, then you would be considered eligible. Same with soybeans. Um, if you can't pinpoint that it's going for human consumption and only for human consumption, then you're going to be ineligible. Um, and then the rest of these are pretty much self-explanatory. Fiber, landscaping, tobacco, or dietary supplements. Activities that have received a federal award from another federal program. So these last three bullet points are basically saying if you've received another grant from USDA, so say you have applied for a rural development grant, and in that rural development grant, you told USDA, I'm going to take this money and I'm going to reshingle my roof. You cannot then take RFSI money and tell USDA, I'm going to reshingle my roof. You cannot repeat activities. You can, however, get, say, a rural development loan and tell USDA, I'm going to reshingle my roof with this rural development loan. You can, with RFSI money, go and put in a new gutter system. That would not be a repeat of that activity. So no repeating activities um, for this grant. All right, on our infrastructure. Uh, so I don't know if these are going, yes, okay. Our minimum is gonna be $100,000. Our maximum is gonna be $3 million. So the minimum that you can apply for is $100,000 and the maximum that you can apply for on your infrastructure grant are gonna be 3 million. Remember, we can only apply for one or the other. For our equipment only grant, your minimum to apply is going to be $10,000. Your maximum is going to be $100,000. So if your piece of equipment is over $100,000, it's not going to cover that.
Infrastructure grants. These are the harder of the two grants. I will be honest and upfront. Um, these are going to require a lot more work than our equipment only grants. So for infrastructure grants, your funds will be awarded no earlier than July 1 of 2024. We will talk later about why I'm not sure if that's really realistic. Um, and then your projects must be completed by May 31st of 2027. That is a hard date that USDA has created. After that day, this RFSI grant will be no more. Um, so May 31st, 2027, all of your infrastructure projects have got to be completed. Your costs must be consistently charged as either indirect or direct cost, but may not be doubly charged or inconsistently charged as both. We'll get into that in just a second. Evidence of critical infrastructure. So we were talking about how you can't purchase land with this grant. So USDA is if you're if you would like to apply for an infrastructure grant and you want to build a brand new facility, you're going to have to prove that you own that land or you lease that land. Um, and then you will also so say you want to improve on an existing facility. You have to prove that that ex that facility exists in the first place. So this statement land structures and other critical resources must be in place and in working condition at the time of the application submission. That's a little bit confusing. Just think of it as if you're building a brand new building, the bare minimum that you've got to have is the land. If you're building an existing facility, you've got to prove that that, that facility exists and that it's in working condition. And evidence of critical resource that's done through a template. Um, so that is on our website and I'll show you all how to get to that. This is only for infrastructure, um, right? So anything that we're talking about in these next couple slides will only be for infrastructure. When we get into our equipment only, you'll see it's a lot. It's a lot more simpler. Um, so don't worry about anything. If you're interested in equipment, don't worry about any of these slides. They do not apply for our equipment only. Matching fund requirements. So. There is a match on your infrastructure. There is no match on your equipment. So for your infrastructure, your match is going to be 50% of the total propo proposed project cost. Unless you are considered historically underserved farmer or rancher, small, small disadvantaged business, woman owned business, veteran owned small business, those, if if that applies to you, your match is going to be 25%. MDAC will require that you self-certify, and you'll see that when we go over our applications. Um, and then every, so in-kind contributions, think of those as contributions where no funds are going to transfer. So volunteer work. So you can do a cash match fund or you can do an in-kind match fund and we will continue to go over that in the next couple of slides but every in-kind or cash contribution that you are going um, to report you're going to have to submit a letter for each of those and we'll show you how to get to that as well indirect costs may count toward the infrastructure grant applications match um, we'll get into that in just a little bit. Program income or any other federal funds are ineligible. So if you make a profit from this grant, which I hope that each and every one of you do, um, none of those profits that you make can count towards your match for your cost share. Um, all matching contributions must be committed or secured at the time an applicant is recommended for an award. You'll see that in your application um, for every line item. You've got to tell whether you're going to match that in cash, match that in kind. And once again, every single one of them is going to have to have a match verification letter. All right, direct costs. So direct costs are going to be cost that you can get a quote or an invoice for. So you go to the co-op and you say, I want 10 T-Post. 
right then and there, that cashier at the co-op can tell you how much each of those T-posts are going to cost, what the tax on it's going to be. If you want it shipped, she can tell you what the shipping is going to be. Um, and then you can pay for it and you can get um, a receipt for it. You know exactly how much it was going to be before you bought it. Those are going to be indirect, or I'm sorry, those are going to be direct costs. Typically, direct costs include but are not limited to compensation of employees um, who work directly on the award, which includes their salary and fringe benefits, travel, equipment, supplies directly benefiting the grant supported project or program. So for all of these, for your salary, fringe and benefits, travel, think of direct cost as you know exactly how much each of your employees are going to get paid at the end of the year. So you can expect that cost. And just keep that in the back of your brain, because when we get into indirect costs, it's going to get a little bit confusing. But if you if you understand what a direct cost is, then it's easier to understand what an indirect cost is. So direct cost, um, the salaries of administrative um, cler and clerical staff should typically be treated as indirect cost. However, if that administrative or clerical service is integral to that project, you cannot perform this project as a whole without that person. If that person can be specifically identified um, with the project or the activity, and it's going to have to be written in your budget and giving prior written approval from the federal awarding agency. Indirect funds. OK, think of indirect funds. So we already talked about direct funds are those that you can get an invoice for. You know exactly how much it's going to cost. Your indirect funds are going to be like your light bill. So at the end of the month, I don't have a clue what my light bill is going to be. I hope that it is a small number. It usually isn't a small number, but. I don't I can't say February 1st. At the end of February, my light bill is going to be $150. I can't say that. Um, now, if oh, the example of, well, some farms have their um, light bills where you're on a program where you know exactly how much it's going to be at the end of the at the end of the month. It's a set rate. Yes, but with your lights, you cannot say I can't say how much energy I'm using in my guest bedroom. There is no I can't pinpoint that I'm using nine dollars and ninety nine cents a month on my guest bedroom lights. So indirect costs, indirect funds are going to be those that you're not going to be able to expect what it's going to be. Your water bill, your light bill, stuff like that. Um, so think of those as your indirect cost. If you can't get an invoice for it, if you can't tell exactly how much it's going to be at the end of the month, it's probably going to be an indirect cost. OK, so we are going to you're going to have to total up and do a little bit of math to find out what your indirect costs are. Um, so your modified total direct costs are going to exclude your equipment. So you're going to take out your equipment. Your capital expenditures, charges for patient care, rental costs, tuition reimbursement, scholarships and fellowships, um, participant support costs, and then other items may be excluded, but only when necessary to avoid serious inequity. So I am not a math teacher, but bear with me here. So to calculate our indirect cost, we are filling out our application. We've got all these quotes for this equipment for um, our contractor. We know exactly how much it's going to cost us to have this building built. And so our direct cost, we've totaled it up to be $10,000. $3,000 of that is going to be in equipment. So to get this $7,000, to get this $7,000, we took our direct cost of $10,000 and subtracted 3,000 of it in equipment to get $7,000. Times this rate right here, the 10% rate. So 
if you do not have a previous agreement with the federal government, your rate is going to be 10%. If that applies to you and you know exactly what I'm talking about, then you'll have a different rate and you'll have to um, send that letter and prove that. But otherwise, if I am speaking a foreign language to you and you have no idea what I'm talking about, your rate is going to be 10%. So we calculated um, our $7,000 from our direct cost minus our equipment. We're going to multiply it by our 10% rate, and that's going to give us $700 in indirect cost. Same thing with this example, $3 million. Um, 30,000 of that is in equipment. That's how we get this number, this $270,000 times 10% would give us $27,000 in indirect cost. If that just went way over your head, we will talk about that later in our application. <laughs> And then this is just the statement about the 10% rate. So unless you've got an agreement, a previous agreement with the federal government, then you'll be at a 10% rate. Otherwise, you know who you are. If that applies to you, we will have to see um, that agreement to award that. Okay, simplified equipment only grants. They are called simplified for a reason because they are very simple, very simple. So your equipment only grants are going to be a 100 percent reimbursement grant so i give you an award letter you go out and you buy that piece of equipment you send me a receipt and i send you back exactly how much you paid for it um these cannot be associated with facility upgrades staffing or other costs so this is strictly equipment strictly going out to the store purchasing equipment that's it um so funds will be awarded no earlier than july 1 of 2024 we'll talk about that in a minute projects must be completed no later than january 30th of 2026 and i think that's going to be a very firm date it should not take three years to purchase this equipment i hope that when y'all get these award letters you're going to go out and purchase that equipment in the next month and I'll pretty much be done with my equipment only grants after that. Um, it shouldn't take three years to purchase that equipment. So that's why the date is a little bit sooner than everything else. Um, we've already talked about a lot of these. So an applicant must not apply for both grants. We've already talked about how to get around that if you do want to get um, some equipment in the infrastructure that you're building. Programs must increase, expand, or replace, not duplicate existing activities. We talked about that with our um, the example with the rural development grant and repeating activities on that. If selected for an award, an infrastructure grant applicant must apply or comply with NEPA, NHPA, ESA. Um, you're going to have to get the permits that are required to build that building. And um, we are getting new information from USDA every single day on this. Um, the, the latest that I've gotten is that once we have, as the state has selected who we would like to fund, when we go to send our recommendations into USDA, I'm going to have to contact each of our infrastructure applicants and we'll have to go through an environmental checklist. Um, pretty much if you break ground, um, it's going to have to go into an environmental review. Um, regardless of that, you're still going to have to get the required permits um, to build that building and to get those, you'll have to go through Mississippi Department of Environmental Quality or MDEQ. Please don't call me and ask me to get you a permit because I'm going to direct you to MDEQ because that is, I don't do anything with that. So, this is not something that you really need to worry about right this second. Um, I would be thinking about it, but I wouldn't go ahead and get those permits before you've been awarded an award. 
Um, so on this slide, it's going to be talking about for our equipment only grants and for our infrastructure grants, you're going to have to send in quotes. So you can't just say, I want to, I'm filling out my application and I want to buy a vegetable washer for $10,000 or $100,000. You're going to have to prove that that vegetable washer is $100,000. So you're going to have to send in quotes. On all of these quotes, you can send in, you can go straight to the store and ask them to give you a quote for it, send that in. You can go online and get an online quote. But for any of those, you need to just really make sure that the cost of delivery and installation can be covered under this grant, but I cannot honor it if it's not in the quote. So say you pick out your vegetable washer for $100,000, but it has to be shipped to your house and you didn't realize that it had to be shipped and you had to pay for shipping until after you've already applied for this money. I can't give you any more money than what you've applied for and what you've been awarded. So you just need to make sure that any delivery cost, any installation cost, sales tax, all of those are going to be included in those quotes. And once again, there is no match requirement for your equipment grants. All right, so our application process and our competitive review process. So how this is going to work, you're going to fill out your application. You'll send it in at the email. Um, that we'll go over in just a minute. You'll send it in. And once I have all of the applications and the deadline has passed, we are going to take those applications and we are going to submit them to an independent review panel. That review panel is going to rank your applications for us. Um, and we'll go over the rubric in just a little bit so you'll be able to know what they're really looking for. They're going to rank those applications. They'll give them back to us. After that, we will sit down and we will decide which ones we are going to fund or which ones are going to be the most beneficial to the state of Mississippi of the ones that have been ranked. Um, after that, we will submit that to USDA. USDA will give us the final yes or no on those. So we could send in an application and we would could think it is great for the state of Mississippi. USDA could send it back and they could say, oh, we're not sure about this one. You might want to pick another one. So once again, I just want to stress that at the very end of all of this, we really don't even get the final say. So it's going to be USDA. Um, Next is our rubric. So I don't know if I'm hoping that y'all can. It's a little bigger on y'all's end. It's really tiny on mine, but this is what our review panel is going to be looking at. So does the project address a need in the local food supply chain? Does the project increase capacity in the middle of the supply chain for local products? Does the project increase economic viability for local producers and processors? Does the project present a realistic schedule of implementation? So if you what that really means is if you apply and for an infrastructure grant and you are going to say reshingle your roof, it shouldn't take you three years to do that. Um, so if you put it's going to take me three years to reshingle my roof, USDA and our independent review panel might go. That's not really realistic, and you might get docs and points on that. Um, is the project outcome realistic to the total investment, and is the budget consistent with the size and scope of the project? What those mean, say um, you want to build a lemonade stand, and you're asking for $3 million to build a small lemonade stand. That is not consistent with the size and the scope of your project. So you'll get docs some points for that. Distressed community index, we will go over that when we get into our applications, but you get so many points depending on where your facility is located and the people that you are impacting. Historically underserved status. Now this applies to the people that you are going to be impacting, the producers, the community that you're gonna be impacting. 
it does not apply to you that it, the applicant so if you are historically underserved farmer rancher new and beginning farmer veteran it's not applying to you it is applying to the producers the processors the community that you're going to be impacting external support impact we are looking to see if there is going to be some external support at your community and local level those letters of recommendation are not required but they will they are helpful they're highly recommended especially if you're doing an infrastructure grant i get a lot of questions about equipment only grants if they should get a, a letter of recommendation and it can be a little bit diff more difficult to get a letter of recommendation on a walk-in freezer um, on your private property um, but if your neighbor wants to write you a letter of recommendation go for it but especially with your infrastructure grants and especially if you are building a large scale processing production plant anything like that you're gonna i would I would highly recommend getting letters of recommendation and support from your community and your stakeholders. Proposed application timeline. So this is a rough, rough timeline. So don't look at this and think this is exactly when this is going to happen. Um, some of these dates are set in stone, but some of them, as you see towards the end, we don't even have um, a hard date on those. So January 8th, we're already past that. Our applications are open. They will close March 15th. We have from March 15th until April 15th to send out those um, applications to our review committee and have them evaluated. May 15th through July 15th, we will send those applications to USDA. Um, I'm going to stress that anything after this july 15th date is going to solely depend on usda getting back those applications to us so july 15th through sometime in september we hope to be contacting everyone um if usda sends back your application and says i just need a little bit more clarification on what exactly this piece of equipment does or why it's important um, July 15th through September ish, we hope to be doing those and contacting y'all and getting your applications completely 100% finalized, sent back to USDA so that in September, October ish, we can submit an award letter to you. We hope. Um, like I said, it's really going to depend on USDA getting those applications back to us by July 15th. Now, I will say, Please, please, please do not purchase anything, anything until you have received an award letter and you have signed on the dotted line and written out an agreement with us. I cannot reimburse, honor anything until after that agreement has been signed. I get a lot of questions about grant writers. If you hire a grant writer to write and fill out this application for you, that will be on your own dime because that is before you received an award letter. That would be before you um, signed a grant agreement with us. So that would be out of your own personal money. I cannot reimburse a grant writer or anything before the time that you've signed on the dotted line. So. Just keep in mind, some of these dates are subject to change. Now, grant recipients will be expected to carry out their projects, maintain clear and consistent communication with MDAC. Please don't make me track you down and bother you for your reports. <laughs> um, we will have some reports and I will show you the report dates and how in-depth those are going to be. Um, the report prop progress in a timely manner, please have those in on time. Um, quarterly and final reports are contractual requirements. So that will be in your grant agreement. If you fail to send in reports and I can't get a report from you and it's been months, um, then you would be in violation of that contract. If selected, each grant recipient must obtain a unique entity ID number or a UEI before being awarded. Now, if you've ever 
applied for a UEI or you've gotten a UEI, you know that it's not a very simple or easy process. It can be a little bit difficult. Um, I will tell you, we'll go over this a little bit, but a UEI number is going to take you three to five business days for them to process it. If anything is incorrect or um, they have any questions about the documents that you've submitted for your UEI, they will reach back out to you via email and then it'll take another three to five days um, once you fixed what they wanted you to fix. So it can take a while for you to get a UEI number. I suggest that during, so you turn in your application March 15th. I suggest that between March 15th and September, you work on getting a UEI and a Mississippi Magic number. Um, it can't hurt you, it's free. Um, and if you're gonna want to get or apply for another USDA grant, you're gonna have to have a UEI number anyways. So I strongly recommend working on getting your UEI number between March 15th and September. It is, if I don't have that UEI number, I cannot pay you. So if you would like to get paid and you would like to expedite your payment, then I would suggest working on that UEI number. These are our reporting requirements. Um, you do not need a UEI number um, to apply. I'm sorry. I, I should go over this. You do not have to have a UEI number to apply. It is on the application, but it is not necessary for you to apply. It will be necessary for me to pay you once you've been awarded. But just as a regular applicant, you don't have to worry about getting that UEI number before you apply. These are our reporting requirements. Um, notice that um, equipment grants must be completed January the 30th of 2026. So that's when if you're doing equipment only, you've got to have everything purchased by then. And then your final report is due April 30th, 2026. So if you're strictly applying for an equipment grant after April 30th of 2026, you'll never have to hear from me again. Um, if you're doing infrastructure, your final report is due July 1st of 2027, but your project must be completed by May 27th of 2027. Application process. So our applications open January 8th um, and they will stay open until March 15th, 2024 at 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. Please don't send me anything at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. I'll feel bad, um, but I won't be able to honor that application. I'll feel really bad, but it will probably just have to go in my junk folder because I can't do anything after 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. Um, applicate, app, completed applications and additional requirements must be submitted electronically to RFSI at mdac.ms.gov. Printed copies will not be accepted. Now, if you, we're going to go over how to download this application. If we go over that and you say, you know, I just really hate filling out this application online. You can print out that application. You can fill it out with, if you've got great handwriting, I would recommend writing it out. And then you can scan it back into me. I'm going to prioritize that. I would really like them to be electronically submitted and be typed out because it can be difficult deciphering people's handwriting. But if worse comes to worse and you just can't figure it out and you don't want to mess with it, you can you have that option of filling it out and then scanning it into me. But it must be submitted via email. I, if you mail it to me, I can't accept it. OK, we're going to come back. Actually, we'll go over this and then we'll go over um, how to get to these applications. So can advanced payments be made? Yes, they can, but we we and USDA are going to prioritize these as reimbursement grants. So I get it. You want a piece of equipment that is $100,000. You just don't have $100,000 laying around to go buy this piece of equipment you we can do advanced payments but you've got to submit a letter 
describing why you need that advanced payment. Um, it's got to be very detailed. That has to be sent in to USDA. USDA will have to approve that. And then if that is approved, this is not like a here's the money you have a year to go buy the piece of equipment. It is a here's the money. Go purchase it next week and send me a receipt. They're going to be watching when you spend that money. So we are prioritizing them as reimbursement grants. Can the grant be used for harvesting supplies? No, we've already talked about that. No tractors, um, anything to do with harvest. If it is, this grant starts after that crop, produce, what have you, leaves its natural intended state. So anything before that, before it's, it leaves the ground, a tree, whatever, it's not eligible. Will the grant pay for labor? We already went over that. Yes, they will. Um, will the state be providing assistance for grant writing? No, we will not, because if we did, it would be me and I do not have the time, <laughs> so we will not. Um, I want to circle back to that labor part. If you are planning on using um, sal like salary, charging salary towards the grant for someone, you're going to also have to provide how much that person is making. You have to pay them a fair wage. Um, you're not going to be able to just come up with a number and say, oh, they get paid $20 an hour. You're going to have to provide some W-9s um, unless you're hiring a new employee. Um, you'll still have to pay, pay them a fair wage. Uh, I get questions about can I pay myself? You can pay yourself through this grant, but you're also going to have to prove what you have usually been making. So if you have no proof of a W-9, you can't just say, oh, well, I make $50 an hour now. That's not going to work. Um, you're going to have to provide some documentation on that. Is farm-raised seafood eligible? We've already gone over that. Farm-raised seafood is eligible. Wild-caught is not. Do purchases have to be made, do be, be American-made and manufactured? So in our guidelines, um, if you look at our request for applications, there's going to be a statement in there about BABA, which is Buy America, Build America, Build America, Buy America. Um, and BABA states that if you are a nonprofit, only applies to a nonprofit. If you're a nonprofit and you are buying iron, steel, or any other manufactured product, and it is over $250,000, that product has got to be American made and American manufactured. If you are not a nonprofit, disregard everything I just said, it doesn't apply to you. But if you are, just know at a $2,500,000 threshold, it's going to have to be American made and American manufactured. Ms. Payton, we have a few questions before we step to the next. Um, yes, yeah. It's in the chat. Yes. Um, OK, so. We're going to go over questions on the PowerPoint first, and then we'll get into how to download these applications and stuff like that. If there are any more questions, we'll address those when it comes to if you have a question about how to download the application, anything about getting a UEI number, about a magic number, please hold off on those um, until after we go over that. So these are questions strictly for the PowerPoint we just went over. So right. let's see. Am I scrolling to the top? Well, I've got them listed at the end of the chat. And oh, then there was okay. more follow up, Mr. Dwayne. Thank you. All right. What about something like, so Riley Family Farms asked, what about something like a forklift or skid steer with pallet forks? That is eligible um, because you can tie that back to um, labeling distribution processing. You could tie that back to that. But as far as like getting a four wheeler or a UTV or anything like that, no, it's going to be generalized piece of equipment. But I believe a forklift and a skid steer are going to be eligible. Um, Dwayne Hamrick, is this requirement for? I think we already answered that one, Mr. Hamrick. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. 
Carrie Don O'Donohue. I'm sorry if I butcher anybody's name. Carrie O'Donohue asked, does each piece of equipment need to meet the minimum of $10,000 or can it be several? It can be several items combined and you'll see that on your application. You can apply for multiple pieces of equipment. It has different lines for you to tally those up, but at a combined, it cannot go over $100,000. Um, Mr. Hamrick asks, can equipment be used for processing food for the cottage food slash farmers markets? Meaning, does equipment have to be used in a commercial kitchen? I don't know if I'm going to be able to answer that question for you. I think I know what you're trying to say. You can apply for equipment can be used for processing foods for your farmer's market yes um but it does not necessarily have to be used in a commercial kitchen uh, we haven't had any questions about that i'm going to save that and get back with you on that please forgive me some of these questions we're going to have to go back and ask usda there is a um a good bit of eligibility questions that come up that have not been brought up to us. USDA has not brought them up and there are some questions that we might have to go back and ask USDA for some clarification. So Mr. Hamrick, I am going to write that question down and get back with you, but I think I think I've answered it in the best of my abilities. I don't believe that any of this equipment has to be used in a commercial kitchen, but it can be used for processing for the farmers markets. Okay, now we are gonna get into going over our applications. So bear with me here. Jonesy's gonna have to make sure I do this right. Okay, Jonesy, can y'all see that? Yes, ma'am. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to go in here and delete these so this will load properly. Okay, so here I am on my computer's home screen. I'm going to go in and I'm going to type in Mississippi Department of Agriculture and Commerce. We are going to be the first one that pops up. Now, on our web page, if you look now, this is if you're on a computer, if you're on a cell phone, I do not recommend loading this application. If you're on a cell phone, I recommend getting on your computer and actually doing it on your computer because we have not really tested out how it will download on a cell phone. So I can't really tell you if it's going to work or not. Alerts and announcements right underneath that. On the right hand side, you'll see resilient food system infrastructure program. We'll click on that. And then this brings us to the home page of USDA RFSI. So real quickly, most of you have been to this website um, because you registered for this listening session. So you did that over here. These are our application forms um, on this side. And then here under additional resources. You've got your specific terms and requirements from USDA, the AMS terms and requirements. Um, USDA historically underserved farmers and ranchers. So if you are not sure if you fit into that category, this link here will answer that question for you. Um, OK, we're going to go back to the home page. You scroll all the way to the bottom of this home page, you'll see our request for proposals that I was talking about earlier. Um, USDA scope and requirements, and then it'll take you, this link will take you to the USDA website. Okay, so downloading these applications. I'm going to click on application forms on the left hand side here. And if you miss anything that I say today, if it goes over your head completely, this YouTube video will explain it um, word for word on how to download these applications. So, First things first, you've got to have Adobe Acrobat Reader. It should be free. So if it asks you to pay for it, exit out. You're on the wrong thing. Um, it should be free. 
So here you'll see our equipment grants, our infrastructure grants, our verification of match and our evidence of critical infrastructure. Remember, these two here are only for your infrastructure grants, not have anything to do with your equipment grants. OK. These two are Word documents, so they open up just fine, and I will show you that. Yeah. So our match verification letter, they open up just fine. You'll have to enable editing so you can edit them, but they work just fine. So we are strictly talking about these two grants when we talk about how to download them. So. I'm going to download our equipment grant first. And when I click on it, it says please wait, which I'm sure if you've tried to download this and have not been successful. This is frustrating. Um, you can wait until the cows come home. Nothing will happen. <laughs> so in order to download this, you've got your Adobe on your computer already. On the right hand side of your screen, you're going to see a download this file. Let me also say this. If you're on a MacBook, it's going to work a little bit differently, and I am not the IT expert. That would be Mr. Jason Jones here. Um, so I I'm sorry, but I cannot tell you how different it's going to be on your MacBook. I don't own a MacBook, but just know if you're on a Mac, it's going to look a little bit different. So. I'm going to click on download this file. And it's going to bring me to my computer's documents. The way I like to do it is I like to download it on my um, desktop, which means that it goes straight to my home page when I will click out of here. Now, if you are one of those people, no judgment here, that has a thousand icons on your desktop. Probably need to download it somewhere else so it doesn't get lost. Um, but regardless, wherever you download it, it's the same process. So I'm going to name this equipment only grant application. OK, and I'm saving this to my desktop. So as you can see, it popped up right here. Now, most of us and the problem that most of us are having is when this pops up right here. We want to click on it. Well, if we click on it. It brings us right back to this please wait page and this is where it starts getting frustrating and you start screaming and getting mad and calling me so once you've downloaded it to your desktop you're simply going to click out of everything just exit out and then you'll see it pop up on your desktop here and we'll click on that now if you let me go back if you get here and you click on this and it brings you back to the please wait button you're going to right click with your computer mouse and it should open up something like this and you'll go to open with and select adobe acrobat what happens with that is especially if you've just downloaded adobe your computer does not recognize that it needs to open it up with adobe so you have to tell it manually. So if that is the problem when you click on this and it brings you right back to please wait, right click on it, open with Adobe Acrobat. Okay, here's our equipment only grant. Like I said, this is a much simpler grant or application than the infrastructure one. So all your basic information, it asks for a UEI number if you have one, Please put that in. That's one less step that we have to worry about. Um, if you don't, don't worry about it. Primary point of contact. Now, if you are. If another. If you're filling this out. And you've already put all this at your name, your address, all that, and then it asks again for the primary point of contact and that applies to you. Your normal instinct is going to be, well, I just filled that out, so I'm not going to fill that out. Please fill it out. Please fill out every line and humor me um, because if you don't, I'm going to have to call you and make sure that you are the primary point of contact. I will have to send you back your application and we'll have to fill it out. So just rewrite it in there. I know it's tedious. Um, Distress Community Index. We talked about this on our app on our rubric. So 
to find your distressed community index score, you're going to click on this little link that they give you. And it's going to bring you to Economic Innovation Group. You'll scroll down. We're in Mississippi. And. OK, I live in Rankin County. My distress score is 14.6. So say I live in Rankin County and my distress score is 14.6, but my facility itself is in Wayne County. Their distress community index is 91.5. It's going to be where the facility is because this distress community in index is the community that your infrastructure or this piece of equipment is going to impact. So say you do like a mobile something mobile and you are traveling to all of these counties and processing in all of these counties. You would put every county that you travel to or say on the infrastructure end, I want to build a facility in Wayne County and then I want to improve a facility in Covington County. You would put both. And then we will take the score of the smallest number. Um, or the largest community distressed impact that you have is the number that we will take, if that makes sense. OK. Now, this is where you'll fill that out, Rankin County. And 41.6, you'll put your score there. OK. Type of applicant. So this is who you are. Are you an agricultural producer, a processor, for profit, nonprofit, project title? It's just a brief description of your project. Executive summary. Please note the name of the applicant organization that, if awarded, a grant will be established. Please make sure that whoever's name goes here in this executive summary. That is the agreement that we will, the person we will establish an agreement with. So if your name goes here and you misappropriate any funds, that is the name of the person that we will be contacting. Project purpose. Um, provide where the middle of the supply chain equipment is going to be used. Is it going to be used for processing, aggregation, distribution, or value added? Type of agricultural food products processed with that equipment. You would add all of these in there line for line. You can add a row. You can subtract a row. Describe the um, the current business operations, including services being offered in the geographic focal area. Describe the specific need that the requested equipment will address. Describe the impact that this equipment will have on local and regional producers, markets, outlets, and more. Establish the number of local and regional producer producers impacted. Once again, the more producers that you can impact, the more competitive your application is going to be. Does the project directly benefit one of the following? Here, the outcome of performance measures below provide a framework that allows grant recipients to track and evaluate the project activities. Please provide expected numbers based on the project scope. So this is what you expect to get out of this project. And then here's where you'll do your equipment. Like I said, if you are applying for multiple pieces of equipment, this is where you can add them. If you are applying for five T posts, you would put five. T post. The number expected acquisition date, so this is when you expect to purchase the product. Please don't put today's date. I would put somewhere a date closer towards September or October on here. And then how much are you requesting? If you are buying five T posts and then you want to buy a T post driver, that is a different item. So you'll have to put it in another line item. But if you're buying five T posts, please don't put T post, T post, T post, T post, T post on each line. That's where your quantity of five goes. And then description and justification. You'll have to give a description of why this equipment is needed. And then all 
quotes must be included in your application submission. So you cannot submit them after the fact. They need to be included with your application submission. OK, that's it for our equipment. Now we will go back in and do the same thing for our infrastructure. Once again, it's going to pop up this please wait. We're going to download it. Save it to our desktop. And then I'm going to exit out of here. All right, our infrastructure. So all of this is going to be the same. All this is going to be the same. Same thing with the distressed community index. All of this is the same. Projected start date and projected end date. Please don't put today's date um, or the date that you fill out the application. Your projected start date, I would say it would safely, you could probably pick a date in September or October. I don't think that they're going to look at this too hard because it is projected, but with your projected end date, you need to just make sure that, like, if you're building a lemonade stand, which is not eligible, but if you were going to build a lemonade stand with this money, and you say, it's going to take me five years to build that, that's not a really realistic time frame. So just make sure that the time frame is realistic. All this is the same. Your project purpose, so purpose of your project, read through all of these and then you can select multiple um, or other. You can give a description of other. Please provide the specific problem, issue or need that this project will address. Project objectives, so this is your hopes, what you hope to achieve from this project. What do you hope to achieve by building this piece of infrastructure? Estimated number of beneficiaries. Um, does this project directly benefit one of the following? If you have um, money coming from another federal grant or state grants, you need to select yes or no and describe what grant it is. Um, stakeholder support. This is the same as our um, equipment grant. These are your projected expected numbers and our budget now this is where you'll self-certify for your matching funds um if you do not select one of these your match is automatically 50 percent now our budget summary so this is the summary of our budget so i would recommend going through here because you'll have to break this down line by line i would recommend starting here first and then coming back up so Personnel, each person you're going to hire for this grant, let it be very clear that you can only pay them for the amount of time that they work on this grant. Say you have someone that tends to your cattle, but you also want them to help you build this piece of infrastructure. You cannot pay them for the time that they spend working with your cattle. You can only pay them for the time that they spend on this grant. So. Um, you'll have to project those levels of effort or hours, how much you're requesting, how much of that are you going to match, and is that match in cash or in kind? You'll have to justify everything. Um, fringe and benefits. Please don't contact me and ask me what your fringe and benefits are because I don't know. Your fringe um, benefits are going to be how much it costs for you to employ that person and either you should know that or your accountant should know that travel where are you going um what type of expense is it is it airfare car rental hotel how many nights are you staying um 
that's pretty self-explanatory. Give a justification for it. Equipment, same thing as your equipment grant. Now, on your infrastructure grant, we've got equipment and we have supplies. So this is stated here. Anything $5,000 or over is going to be equipment. Anything under $5,000 is going to be supplies. So if it is $4,999.99, it is supplies. Same thing, you'll have to justify everything. Construction cost, justification. Contractual cost, justification. And any other expenses and a justification. Here's why you'll do your indirect cost. Um, most of you are going to have a 10% rate. These are our requested funds. This is a my match fund. And then is it going to be in cash or in kind? And then I would scroll all the way back up. Where it has project summary. And each subtotal here, I would. That's how much you're requesting. This is how much of it you're going to match in cash or in kind. Okay, that is it for our infrastructure application. Now we're gonna move on to talk a little bit about SAMS. All right, so for your UEI number, you're gonna go into SAM.gov and it's gonna pop up all of these alerts. If you have had a DUNS number in the past, it is a SAMS number. They just changed the name of it. So when you log in, um, I'm sorry, let's go back. You're going to go to this web page at SAM.gov and you're going to click sign in on the right hand side. If you are new to SAMS or new to getting a DUNS number, you're going to create an account. You'll put in your email address here, English, select that you read all of the rules of use and then select that you've read them, submit that, and then it's going to send you an email. In that email, it's going to say, um, it's going to come from login.gov and it's going to say confirm email address. Once you click on that, it should take you to a place where you can set up your password. If it doesn't, if it brings you back to this page, that means that the email that you have submitted is associated with SAMS already. So at that point, I would go to forgot your password and create a new password. But once you've created a password, you will put your email, your password in, and then you'll do sign in. Now it's going to ask you to verify it through your phone number. You'll have to give your phone number. Um, so it's going to text me and I'm going to put in the code that it texts me. And it'll bring you to this home page. At this point, you'll go to get started. You'll create a new entity and you'll follow the steps through there. Now, on our website, we do have um, a little printout right here at the quick start guide to getting your UEI number. And it goes through how to apply and what you need to be applying for. If you have any questions on this or when you get to doing your SAMS number and it gets confusing, give me a call and I can probably walk you through the process. All right, now for our Mississippi Magic number. You have got to have a SAMS or a UEI number on the federal end. You have to have a Mississippi Magic number on Mississippi's end. So this is just so that we can pay you um, we have to have your name in our system and it's got to be associated with an account. So if you'll type in Mississippi. Magic self registration. And it'll be the first one that pops up state of Mississippi self supplier self registration. And it'll bring you to this screen. Um, on this. You are a grantee. And the only thing you have to fill out is your the ones that have a red asterisk next to them. Please make sure. So once you fill this out, you'll have to send me a W9 so that I can um, submit that. Please make sure that 
Everything that is on your W-9 is correct on this end as well. Otherwise, I'm going to have to contact you. We're going to have to fix it, and it's going to take a lot longer. Okay. So with that being said, are there any questions that we can go through now? Mr. Dwayne did have a question there. Okay. All right, so I'm going to start back up with. Um, all right, Mr. Dwayne said, I believe Mississippi cottage food laws allow you to produce items in your home if sales are under a certain amount. Please. I'm not familiar with that, um, but like I said, I'll write that question down and I will ask USDA. That has not been brought up yet. Um, so I will get back to you on that. I have your email and your phone number from when you registered, so I'll reach back out to you. All right, Miss Christie said, if a new structure is built and some growing equipment is being requested that falls in the line of decreasing water use or falls in green protocols, can new equipment be purchased for that for growing? I would go as far to say growing is going to be pre-harvest. So anything for growing is not going to be applicable. If that, if the um, equipment that was being requested for decreasing water use was for post-harvest after it had been harvested, then it would apply. But because it's for growing, I don't think that that's going to apply. Um, okay. And then Mr. Dwayne said, so to clarify, if you do an infrastructure grant, you can also buy special purpose equipment like you would under the equipment only grant. Correct. Correct. If you do. Um, so if you are if you're wanting to build or improve on an existing facility and say you want to buy a freezer or a storage, you want to go ahead and, and purchase like a, a storage unit. Um, maybe that's not the best example because you can't buy a building with this grant, but you want, you're building an infrastructure and you want to buy a vegetable washer. That is applicable under this grant. You would have to apply under an infrastructure grant, but it is applicable. Now, if you just wanted to buy a vegetable washer, that would be considered equipment. Um, and you're not building anything new. Um, if that if if anybody needs any more clarification and I'm not explaining these great, please let me know. Um, can you provide the link to get the Mississippi match number? Yes, I can. I will. Jonesy, can you put that in the chat for me, please? I'm sorry, what was that? Can you go and the Mississippi self registration? Can you get the link to that and put that in the chat for me, please? Yeah, Paul. Thank you. We'll get that to you. All right. Projects that impact a group of producers will have some priority. Yes, I think that I think I understand your question. Yes. So I think what you're trying to ask. Um, if you are a single producer, processor, what have you, and you're applying for this grant to get um equipment or you want to build a piece of infrastructure but it's just you that it's really going to impact it's not really going to impact a group of processors or producers then you can still apply you could still be awarded a grant but they're going to take priority for applications that benefit multiple producers so if you can get in and like on like a cooperative and where y'all build a piece of infrastructure that multiple producers can use, that would benefit you more than just going in on your own. Um, Mr. Tony, if I did not answer your question, please let me know. Um, you did. That, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and once again, I just want to be very transparent. There's a lot of questions that we are just like now getting, we haven't been getting these questions even after the four listening sessions that we've gone through. So if it seems like 
I'm thinking about something, it's because I am I'm thinking on how to answer that question for you. <laughs> um, all right, Miss Rhonda and Kevin Ford, would things like sellers, cleaners, and forklifts be covered in an infrastructure grant? We've already covered forklifts. If it's for, if you can tie that into processing, packaging, labeling, um, production, um, anything after harvest, then yes, it would be considered. Sellers and cleaners. I will have to ask about that. I have not had any questions on sellers or cleaners. Um, those are good. Okay, shellers are good. What about cleaners? Sorry, I have someone. Cleaners are good. Okay, then you're good. Those are all eligible. Um, as long as you can tie them into your post harvest processing side. Um, but yes, those are eligible. Um, Miss Christy said, can I get assistance on the grant download for a Mac? While talking I downloaded Adobe but I still could not get the app to download. Miss Christy, I am going to direct you to Jason Jones. I have your number in your email. So how about Jonesy if that works for you? Do you have time today to get with Miss Christy or maybe Monday and help her download this? Yeah, I can try to do a breakout room real quick and get her started. Okay, Miss Christy, Miss Jonesy's going to take care of you. Um, P. Shellers, yes, I'm sorry, if I said sellers, I'm sorry, P. Shellers, I knew what you were talking about. Um, yes, we can use them at the fruit stand. Okay, well then, yeah, if you can tie that back into processing, let's just be clear. A lot of these things could be considered eligible, but when you go to describe them on your application, if you don't tie that back into why it's important for processing and your post harvest they're going to want a really good justification on what you're using this piece of equipment for why it is integral um, to you having and why it is so important for you to have in your post harvest processing so just make sure that you are stressing that in your application can you send a link for the application in the chat that I can share with my producers. Mr. Dewberry, so that link, the way that it was, or the applications, the way that it was created, I can't even email it to anybody, um, which is unfortunate. And I don't think that once you download on your computer, you can email it to anybody. So it's not like a link. And that is the way that we received it from USDA. So I'm sorry. I wish that I could. That would make my life and everyone else's lives so much easier. But unfortunately, I don't have a link for it because it was not shared to me in that way. Are there any more questions? Please speak now or forever hold your peace. No more questions? All right. Well, I think we are good to go. I will put up my information one more time. Oh, 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 we have a question. I lied. OK. Would someone like a would something like a cargo van for distribution be covered? No. OK, so on vehicles. Um. You can go out and buy a refrigerated truck. You can use a delivery truck, I believe, um, as long as it's helping with. It has to be a specialized, especially for middle of the food supply chain, processing, aggregation, distribution. Um, it, that's going to have to be a specialized piece of equipment, but like a refrigerated truck, that'll work. Um, but as far as going out and buying like a van, I don't think that that's going to be eligible because keep in mind that would be a generalized piece of equipment. So if you can't 100% tie that back into the middle of the food supply chain that we talked about, then it's it's not it's going to be a generalized piece of equipment, and they're not gonna they're not gonna allow for that. Does a reefer truck? 
have to be new. No, I'm glad you brought that up. I'm sorry I forgot to mention that. None of this equipment has to be brand spanking new. There's nowhere in here that says it's got to be brand new. However, I would not recommend going on Facebook Marketplace and finding anything. I would recommend going to a reputable source, somewhere where you can get a quote for it, because I don't know how well USDA is going to take any quotes from like Facebook Marketplace or like your neighbor. It's like, I'll sell you something. It's probably going to have to be a pretty good, reliable quote. That's as far as I'll go on that. Can I comment on that? Yes. Uh, on that, on uh, so like what uh, some reputable company like a Penske or something like that that may have yeah. trucks off lease and things mm -hmm. of that nature because those trucks are very expensive. When I say reputable company, I mean, don't if your neighbor is selling a used piece of equipment and he's going to sell it to you and he takes a piece of paper and writes down this is how much it's going to cost. I don't know if USDA will grant that. What I'm saying is when I say reputable, you know, it's got to be somewhere that can give you a quote, um, a nice quote that you can turn in and send to us. But nothing from I wouldn't say anything from like Facebook Marketplace where you're just screenshotting it off of there or like your neighbor writing it down on a piece of paper. It needs to be a legit quote. OK, yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Any other questions? Hey, Morris, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, Mr. Hodges. All right. How are you today? Good. How are you? Good. I've done the, uh, <clears throat> what we call this thing. Let me look again. Uh, something self, self, what is it called? Supply registration as a grantee. I've done that. Okay. And you mentioned W9. When do when do I have to send that in? Um, I just need that before you have once before I can pay you. So if you have not been um sent us an award letter, once you get sent an award letter, worry about getting me a W9. You can go ahead and send it to me if you're ready for it, and it won't hurt you to go ahead and be in our system. But I really won't need that until you've gotten an award letter. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I will add in, go back here and present my um, contact information. Now on my contact information, please keep in mind, this is not the only grant that I do. Um, can y'all see that, my contact information? Yes, we're good. OK, um, so please keep in mind, I am not always in my office. This is not the only grant that I do. I am a um, I went to wildlife school, so this is not something that I. Do all the time grant coordination. <laughs> um, so most of the time I'm out of my office doing something with wildlife out in the field somewhere. So if you need me. Um, the best place to reach me is going to be my cell phone or um, email. If you call my office, they get forwarded to my cell phone, but sometimes it doesn't work. Um, but you can call or text me and on my cell phone, and I usually am much better at responding on that than getting back in the office and going through my voicemails. Um, yes. Also calls preferably from eight o'clock to 5 p.m. Um, I will go as far to say if you call me after 5 p.m. Monday through Friday, I probably won't answer. <laughs> you can text me. I'll text you back the next morning, but I probably won't answer. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Nope, okay. Well, that is it. That concludes our RFSI listening session webinar. So 
If any of you have any personalized questions or would like to speak with me, feel free to call me. Um, I'll be in the office most of the day today. Um, I hope that this was informative and helpful, and I hope that no one has any questions because there are no questions and I went over it as the best of my ability. Um, like I said, this is very new to me. This is very new to USDA as well. So there still are a couple questions that I just can't answer and I apologize. I will get back with y'all. I think the only person that had a question that I could not answer was Mr. Um, Hamrick. Um, I think I got the answer about the shellers. So Mr. Hamrick, I will contact you after I've gotten with USDA. All right, thanks guys. I hope everyone has a great weekend and it was nice to see everyone.